you asked me to talk about medical emergency teams and do they matter? Um, and uh, it, in the first place, I, I am obliged, uh, I have to declare that there are no potential conflict of interest here, but if I think a bit further, I, perhaps I have some conflict of interest that I have to tell you. I've been a very strong proponent in Sweden for medical emergency teams uh, and focused very much on these teams. I've been arranging national meetings on medical emergency teams and their importance. And also, actually, it's 10 years ago that I was part in a pro-con debate on SSAI in Gothenburg, where I had the role to be pro medical emergency teams. So there is some, some conflicts of interest here. So let's see what I'll do about that. So you, know, you asked me, what is a medical, uh, uh, you asked me to talk about medical emergency teams, but what, what is a medical emergency team? I mean, we have always had this traditional, the previous method there. There is a, an ICU physician coming to see the patient and, and, and to take a stand, should the patient be brought to the ICU or should the patient stay in the ward? Uh, the medical emergency teams can be a bit different. It could be an ICU physician and an ICU nurse. It could be two ICU nurses or other combinations of, of uh, staff and also equipment. For example, when I used to work in, in Lund previously, uh, the med team arrived in the ward with pen and paper. But nowadays, when I work at Karolinska in, in, in Stockholm, we, we are coming with all the stuff you can ever imagine that you need to bring along. Defibrillators, uh, blood gas analysis, analysis equipment, and um, lots of, of uh, things. So, if you ask me or someone else, do they matter? What are we talking about? I don't know. Do you? Yeah? So, how may a met team matter. You, you can have s quite some expectations here. Uh, you may expect the MET team to identify the deteriorating patient earlier, but how could that be? I mean, if no one asked the team to come there, how could the team de detect the patient earlier? That's, that's impossible. So there's no role for the team in that sense, I think. Uh, reduce cardiac arrests, reduce mortality and morbidity in the hospital? Well, yes, perhaps, if we are told to see the patient, I would say. We can, and that's quite obvious, we can assess uh, and, and treat the patient and resuscitate the patient in the ward. And for that reason, I would say that, that the, the MET team may matter in, in a couple of instances when we ask to see the patient there. And then we, when we are present in the ward, we can have one attitude that is teaching and trying to educate the staff around us to be good role models, to, to show them how, how you approach the, the sick patient in an ABCD model, and you can see the first or most important things first. And that, I think, is a very important role when you are in the ward as an ICU physician or anesthesiologist, that you are a role model and you, you, you should be aware of your example. Another part is that you, you sh um, when, when we talk about medical emergency teams, we have also stressed very much that we should be very open-minded when, when, uh, when the staff in the ward calls us. A more traditional way to, to approach a request for an ICU assessment has, I mean, I think too often been oh, you have another patient for us, and we have just one, one more bed. Is it really necessary? Um, I don't think that's so, so, so common anymore, but, but I, I've heard that m a number of times. But I mean, our attitude as a team or as an ICU physician, physician should always be, thank you for calling, how can I help you? And that part of the concept, I would say. Another very important part is that when the patient deteriorates to a certain extent, uh, in my experience and many others as well, the MET team is quite often the team that identifies the dying patient and we can assist in, in, in come to that kind of conclusion and decisions to limit care and perhaps assist in, in starting palliative care. 
And that's quite an important issue, I think, that is a bit beside this topic today, but, but it's very, very interesting. And, and in a number of places, there's come to some sort of combination between a medical emergency team and a kind of palliative initiation team. Another role for the MET team could be to substitute absent doctors on the wards and then saving not only patients but also young nurses that are really lonesome and, and in a tough situation. I can see that quite often. I think you do as well. And if you don't have the, the teaching attitude when you come as a MET team, you can come as a brave rescue team and just grab the patient and leave the patient there and do your stuff. And then you will de-skill the staff there. And perhaps it, it might be, no matter what attitude you have when you're present as a MET team, uh, why are the doctors in the wards not there anymore? What are they doing? Why are the nurses so alone? Is it because we have started this system and they rely on us to be there? I think this might be something we have to consider. So, de-skilling of staff in the wards. And finally, if we are working as teams in the wards, there are more than one doctor going to see the patient. So, there is a cost in staffing and economic resources when we implement the teams. So there are a number of issues that matter about these teams. But uh, I suppose you wanted me to focus on reducing mortality or, or unexpected cardiac arrests and so on. And briefly, I do not know of any studies showing the effect of the team per se on mortality or in-hospital cardiac arrests. Do you? But there are a number of studies describing rapid response systems. And let me get back to these systems. And uh, there are coming more and more evidence that the systems, they may reduce mortality as well as in hospital cardiac arrests. But then we are back to the uh, pre previous problem. What is a rapid response system? And these systems are very different. But just a, a brief summary of, of, of summaries up to 2012. It, this is publication from 2013, a meta-analysis on the effect of rapid response systems on non-ICU adult cardiac arrest. And the sum effect in, in this uh, meta-analysis uh, uh, is the odds, ra odds ratio 0 0.62 with a confidence interval well below 1. And if you look at the effect on in-hospital mortality in general, it's the same tendency, but not, not as clear-cut. The odds ratio is 0.88, and the confidence interval is up to 0.96. So it's not really a strong indication, but, but there's a clear tendency. But what is a res rapid response system? Well, in the first place, you have, you have an event uh, to the left. The patient gets uh, sick or deteriorates. And you, you have to, to have a system how to detect it. An early warning score, for example, some kind of routine, some kind of competence and, and staff present. And you have some kind of trigger system, for example, news is seven or news is five, or you feel worried or concerned about the patient. That's the kind of trigger. That part of the system is the afferent uh, limb of the rapid response system. And that's what we've been talking mostly about so far. That's what happens in the, in the hospital in general and in the wards. Then you, then you have the response, the efferent limb. And there you have the teams. You can have the cardiac arrest team, you can have the MET team or outreach team or MIG team or whatever you call it, uh, that gets a response on the crisis. And um, hopefully these teams help the staff in the ward to solve the problem for the patient. And uh, in more detail, the afferent limb could be a system for identifying the deteriorating patient, early wound score, and similar systems. There could be continuous monitoring, and that's the plan for my hospital in Stockholm, that, that every patient should, should be continuously monitored in all wards. That's, that's actually decided. 
there should be some criteria regarding triage and transfer to a higher level of care. There needs to be some, some extent of staffing, enough nurses, enough doctors, and perhaps there should be some A, B, C, D, E competence in the wards, at least some. And I think we have to consider how much effort we should put in that. Should we be the brave rescuers coming to, to do the A, B, C, D, E work, or should we put effort in educating staff in the wards in these issues? In a sense, it seems to me that the tendency in, in, in general, hospital care nowadays is, is, is that it is a, a prestigious role to be a super specialist. And I would say that the super specialists, the single organ doctors, they are really incompetent in everything else. And as Sven Eert talked about, we, we need to be mods, multi-organ doctors. That, that's an important role in the hospital. And we are mods, geriatricians and, and pediatricians, perhaps. Um, yeah. And then also, are beds in the hospital managed in an optimal way? There's a lot of, of beds, not a lot, but it's very hard to find beds in the middle of the week. It's easier on Monday morning and Friday afternoon. And then when you run into to the weekend, it's, it's problematic again. Is the logistics optimal for the critical ill patients? Because these structures are behind the problems when we put the patient that is too sick in the wrong place. And then we have the, uh, the efferent limb, the response, the medical emergency team, or to put it in another setting, the fire brigade. Because when a house is set on fire, the fire brigade, brigade has to come there to do something about the total crisis. Uh, as the medical emergency team do or does as well, as well. And I think that many of us that have been working with medical emergency team have felt that when we started these medical emergency teams, we, we were more prophylactic than the cardiac arrest teams. But shouldn't we put these things a bit further? Go from cardiac arrest teams to medical emergency teams to the afferent limb. Because there we have strong, uh, the, the greater problems that's also Gitte told us about. And how do you prevent houses from, from burn and, and, and save pe people that live in these houses? You, you should have good building techniques and fireproof materials and similar. You should have plans for emergency exits and good information about info emergency exits. And when there is a bad prevention, the fire brigade will make a greater difference. And when there is a bad prevention, the medical emergency team will make a greater difference. So, let's hope that the prevention is good, then the medical emergency team will be unnecessary. And that's my main point here. And I think it was this article that, that opened my eyes in a way, and that this was in 2010 in JAMA, that when Pronovost and Litwok wrote this article, Rethinking Rapid Response Teams. And in the end of the article, it says, for the patient whose condition deteriorates while receiving inadequate care in an improper unit, efforts should be made to ensure that they receive adequate care in a proper unit. We should move away from taking credit we intensivists for rescuing patients who experience triage errors. We should focus on patient flow and to provide each patient with the right care at the right time, no more, not less. If the affirm limb is perfect, we will identify the upcoming crisis in due time and very planned move the patients to the higher level of care. And I think that should be the vision that we should keep in mind. So the challenge for the rapid response system is not the team, it's rather the early detection of deterioration. It's to make the triage in time. 
and perform an undramatic transfer of the patient to the proper unit. And this is, this is not our issue. We, we can assist, we have good competence, uh, but it's, it has to be a hospital-wide challenge that cannot be solved by the Met. And that's my final message. Thank you.